pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, um, who I, has had, he just has done everything. <laughs> we went to his um, website and saw all of the things that he had done during his life up to now, and I'm sure there'll be more. <laughs> Please welcome uh, the Reverend Dr. Ray. Well, how is everybody today, first of all? Great. So one of the things that I do when I tend to speak in front of folks is I gauge whether or not I believe folks based upon the level of energy that I'm receiving. And right now I'm feeling a little, uh, a little doubting Thomas kind of. So I'm going to give you, that was a practice run. Imagine that... The Queen of England or Oprah is getting ready to walk through that door and <laughs> the excitement or the energy of how you feel or, and if it's not really how you feel, but it's how you want to feel. Ready? <laughs> Give me a warm up. One, two, three. How are you today? Yay! See, that's what I'm talking about. Okay. Now, the reason that's important is because, so one of the things... Uh, Reverend Henry wanted me to talk about was this idea of ordinary spirituality, right? Because I have a very interesting background. You know, as was mentioned, there are a whole bunch of things that I have done in my 53 years thus far. Like a whole lot of things. Like I have 10 degrees and a whole bunch of training and a whole bunch of stuff ranging from visual arts to American Sign Language to this thing we call spirituality, etc. Like there's a lot of stuff. However, there's a lot of sorrow in there as well. A lot. Right? So this idea that we can choose how we want to respond to life. So when we say, how are you? There's a difference between how are you how you am being, and how you feel. So this idea of how do you feel today might be, eh. you know, I've got this thing right here called arthritis, and got this thing called allergies, and stuff. I got this thing that I, you know, so it affects how I feel. But there's this part of us, anybody in here ever heard of uh, this gentleman by the name of Viktor Frankl? So, Viktor Frankl, very famous gentleman. Anyone who hasn't heard of him? Okay, so a couple of people. Okay, so the, the Cliff Notes version. Heard of Hitler? Okay, just make sure. We got, so we're on the same page. So Hitler created this thing called the Holocaust and concentration camps. And Viktor Frankl was in a concentration camp and watching family members suffer and die and horrid, horrid abominable things. And one day he realized that he was not the prisoner. That the German soldiers were the ones who were the prisoners. Because what he realized is, they can affect my body. But there is that part of me that they cannot touch. And because they cannot touch that truest part of me, I'm already free, even though I am behind fences and barbed wire and there are guns. Even though, and when he realized, I am free and they are imprisoned, he knew in that moment that he was going to physically be free. That he had a message to share with the world. But here we are, in our daily lives, with stuff going on, and we don't feel quite as powerful, or as free, or as happy, joyful, beautiful, any of that stuff. We don't feel it because the aches and pains affect us. Sorrows affect us. Grief affects us. The news affects us. Our in-laws affect us. <laughs> stuff happens, right? So this idea of ordinary spirituality, ordinary. Are any of us truly ordinary? Because most of the times when we think of the word ordinary, it's like, eh, same old, same old. You know, it's just an ordinary donut. To me, donuts are magical. 
Because if you've ever eaten a really good donut, it, like, it's like, oh, from what gate of heaven did this descend? <laughs> like, oh my, oh, I don't want to take another bite, but it's so, it's so delicious. <laughs> To me, it's magical that somebody, somewhere, someday said, I'm going to put this and this and this together in a bowl. I'm going to stir it, and I'm going to fry it, and ask their children or their husband or somebody, their wife, somebody, taste this and tell me what it tastes like. And they're like, oh, delicious. And then now, today, we can go to Dunkin' Donuts or Krispy Kreme, or we can get a cookbook and open the cookbook and make them ourselves, and they're delicious. So there's no such thing as an ordinary, there's no such thing as an ordinary donut. But we oftentimes think of our lives as ordinary. Like there's nothing particularly special about our lives. That if someone came and said, so I'm going to give you a book advance, I want you to write a book about your life. Like nobody's going to read that. Like nobody wants to read about me. I haven't done anything remarkable. I haven't, I haven't, you know. Eh. The president's dog, President Bush, had a dog. And the dog wrote a book. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not really sure exactly of the mechanics of. <laughs> I'm not really sure about that, but a very intelligent dog apparently wrote a book. And the book didn't just go to Barnes & Noble, aisle seven, further shelf, down at the bottom, next to, what is this, anthropology. Like it's New York Times bestsellers list. One of the top 10 on the New York Times bestsellers list. The president's dog, what do you do? Well, I was there at the embassy, and guess what? Like, what are you, what is the president's dog telling stories about? But we don't have a story. We don't have something that is unique and special about our lives that we could share with the world. Hmm. So there's this guy by the name of Carl Jung. Heard of him? Yes. So Jung says, I asked myself, what is the myth you are living? And I found that I did not know. So I took it upon myself to get to know my myth and regarded this as the task of tasks. I simply had to know what unconscious or pre-conscious myth was forming me. What conscious or pre-conscious myth was forming me? Every single one of us has a myth. And I don't mean myth in terms of like this make-believe, blah, blah, blah. I'm talking about a myth is a story with symbolism and meaning that transcends time, gender, race, ethnicity, region, it transcends all of it. That's why, so when you go to the movies, and we don't go to the movies generally today to see things about Hera, and Athena, and Toph, and Mott. We go to see Superman, Aquaman, Captain Marvel, Black Panther. They are our modern day mythologies that people are presenting. And they transcend, which is one reason why they have such great appeal. But each and every one of us has such a thing. There, there's this thing called spirituality that when we are grounded and really get to know what it means, then meditation and washing the dishes becomes the same thing. Because you're doing it mindfully. That washing the dog or driving to work becomes a spiritual practice because you're in a zone of what does it mean to be rather than focusing on, they didn't use their turns, oh, <laughs> and allowing others to, you know, steal our peace, rob us of our joy. So, March 25th, 1966, this was born. <laughs> into a home that was very dysfunctional. I'm the youngest of six boys. My mother prayed diligently for no girls. She didn't want any girls. For the whole reason she said she didn't want to do any, any hair. But the funny thing is, when I was about 19, 20, I grew my hair and asked her to braid my hair. So she, 
So it's still ha 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 ha, you mom. <laughs> so dysfunction. Everyone in my family, immediate family, has done drugs, is doing drugs. Or as I often joke and say, they took photos of pictures of drugs and sold the pictures of drugs or smoked the pictures of drugs because that's how in drugs the people in my family were drugs or alcohol, everyone. And even though that wasn't my thing of choice, I did develop a very addictive, very addictive, harmful state of being, right? So one of the things I was addicted to was depression. I, and one of the other things that I, that on the, on the website, I also teach and practice martial arts. So I say that, you know, martial arts, you start with a what color belt? White belt. With the intention of becoming a? Black belt. I had a black belt in depression. Trust and believe. You bring me anything good, and I would be like, boom! However, the sky is going to fall. Woo! Bring me something good. Boom! I've got the other shoe that's getting ready to drop. Yes! Like, I could, I could take a blessing and flip it on its head in a heartbeat. I mastered this thing called sulking. <laughs> this thing called, don't let people know how you feel. Oh, I'm doing good. I'm great. Which goes back to how we started. Because oftentimes we'll say we're good. Simply because we're hiding behind the facade. Because we don't want people to really know. We don't want to be vulnerable enough to let people in because when we let people in, people hurt us, they disappoint us. They have, I'm sure if you were to take an MRI of my back all the times that I was stabbed in my back from family, friends, or people that I trusted, I've got an armory on my back from all of them, right? And so we don't want to trust people, but we're people. And ultimately, the only way to connect the only way, in, uh, so I'm the senior minister of the Center for Spiritual Living in Greater Baltimore, and in CSL, Centers for Spiritual Living, Religious Science or Science of Mind, one of the things that we have set forth as our vision for the last several years, the overall organization has set as the vision, is how do we create, demonstrate, and manifest a world that works for the highest and best for all? If I don't trust people, then my spiritual practice becomes a spiritual practice of distrust and hypocrisy. And if I am the stone being dropped into the, the lake of creation, then what are the ripples that are now rippling from me? Are they joy and peace and love? Or are they discontentment? I don't trust you. I don't like you. I would rather you not be here. Like, what is the vibration that I am sending out? And we, we oftentimes say, well, eh, eh, you know, there's this part of us that, well, is that, it, like, does it really happen that way? Have you ever walked into a room where people were relatively quiet and you felt the tension in the room? There was nothing directly being said, but you felt the tension. We even say things like, it was so tense you could cut it with a knife. It was so thick. Have you ever sat on something, sat on a, a chair, a bench, somewhere in the public, and you're sitting there, and and you feel like, hmm, and you feel like someone's watching you, and you turn around and see someone staring right at you? How did you feel a stare? Because we're energetic beings, we give off vibes and energy, but it starts with us. So I grew up surrounded by all this stuff, and was abused on top of being abused, on top of being abused. So if you name a type of abuse, I probably have experienced it at least once or twice. Any of them. And all of them on some level, way, shape, or form. From family directly, verbal, emotional, intellectual, neighbors, sexual, etc. All of them. And I hated myself so much through middle school. Now, elementary school, as long as I had some Legos and some things to color with, because I was a comic book nut, like as long as I had my comic books and some coloring books and stuff, I was like, I, I was able to get into a zone where I could forget about stuff. 
And plus, I didn't really know and understand what alcoholism was. I just knew mom liked to drink stuff from that brown bottle a lot. And it smells really bad. It's not like Kool-Aid, but, but she loves it. Or the thing in the bottle, the, 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 the can that she pops that says, what's that say? Bud we eyes or whatever that says. I don't even know what it is. I guess that's French. I don't know. But she loves to drink that often, too. And it's nasty, because she would give me a sip to put me to sleep. It was nasty. She's like, boy, go to sleep. I don't go to sleep. I'll drink this. <laughs> so I don't know why it put me to sleep and didn't put her to sleep. She had to drink 12 or 15 of them before she passed out. But it's what she loved. But middle school, I knew. Because middle school, they taught us about this stuff. And I'm like, oh, my parents are alcoholics. Oh, my brothers do drugs. Oh, oh my, oh, so it wasn't, so wait a minute, so what the neighbor did to me wasn't, oh my, oh, 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 oh. Why did I let that happen? Why did I deserve that? I must be a bad person. So I internalized all of this hatred towards myself. And at that time, I grew up in a non-church going Christian home, meaning the Bible was present, you might hear the name Jesus once in a while, but didn't none of us go to church. We didn't sit around the table and pray. But you do something bad, somebody's going to feel like, you're going to hell! I'm not sure about that. But I grew up in this environment of, so, I'm like, okay, okay, so, God, God, okay, God in the sky, kill me in my sleep, please, please, please. Because I don't like where I live, I don't like, I don't, I can't do this anymore. So for years, between suicidal ideations and whatnot, I just didn't want to be here. Then I got into the martial arts and started to explore things related to the philosophy of martial arts. Like Bruce Lee, one of the things Bruce Lee would quote from uh, Lao Tzu, the Tao Te Ching, was this idea of it is not by adding more to your life that you find peace. But it is by removing, it is by the removal of the unessential that you get to the core of your being and find peace right there. So rather than me trying to get more friends, get more of this, get, 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 it was like, wait a minute, start letting go. And not even the physical things, but letting go of the ideas of. So I explored with that. And I moved through like uh, Buddhism and Hinduism, and I moved through all these things, and then over the years... I eventually go ahead and I find this thing called New Thought. It's like, but this woman named Louise Hay, change your thinking, change your life. <laughs> what? Shh, what? Shh, 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 shh. Change your thinking, change your life. I, yeah, I heard you say that the first time, but clearly it can't be that simple or give it a shot. What do you mean give it a shot? Try it this way. <clears throat> And sometimes it's something as simple as we see something that is, like there's, there's a story, uh, some tell it as a Zen story, some tell it as a Taoist story, but there's this farmer, and he's got children, got a son, and got horses and whatnot, and stuff happens, right? And so the army comes through, well first, first. Wow, you've got horses. You must be so happy to be, like, wealthy. Like, that's such a good thing. Maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. Okay. Much, whatever. And then his son goes out and he finds a new, beautiful stallion to add in. And they're like, oh, your son found, oh, my goodness. Things are going to be so much better. Like, that's even more money. It is so, it's great to be you. Maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. It just is. So then the army comes and they're like starting to look for, you know, soldiers. And they're like, oh, your son's of that age. They're going to come and get your son. Oh, that's such a bad thing. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. The son's training the horse. He falls off the horse, breaks his leg. Oh, you are so lucky that he, now he won't go to, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. So the idea is we quickly judge what's good, what's bad. But maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Maybe it's about how we perceive it. For example, we often talk about things or people being negative. She's so negative. I don't like being around her. 
time. She's so, she always talks negative. She's just negative. Negative Nancy is her name. That's what I call her. She's just negative. Like we say things like this because they're vibes. She just, she just walks in and she brings the vibe of the room down. She's just, mm. you ever heard of a battery? Battery has two ends. A positive and a but it has a negative. Shouldn't we cut the negative part off and get rid of it since negative is bad? Like we should get rid of it, right? No. Because if we get rid of the negative, then the battery no longer works. So maybe Nancy, negative Nancy isn't negative. Maybe what's negative is my perception of her. Maybe that's what, it's how I'm perceiving. So I've gotten to this point where, for me, part of my ordinary spirituality involves the practice of how do I reach a place of balance where no matter what's going on, in the, in, anybody in here familiar with martial arts? Anybody practice martial arts? What style? Uh, Aikido. You said? Aikido. Aikido? Yes. <gasps> oh, yes, perfect. Yeah, yes. Yeah. My daughter's a third degree Tacido. Uh, Tacido. Anybody else? So a couple of the hands. Now y'all don't want to raise hands. Jiu-Jitsu? Okay, so there's this idea, and I'm going to specifically use Aikido, because in Aikido, we have this exercise. One is an extension, and there's this idea that you are extending from your hara, from your center, whether it's rowing exercises or an extension. It's extending from here. So no matter what's going around here, it's this idea of how do I move from here to always be the center of the storm. So whatever's going on, when someone says something to me, my idea is, it's not good, it's not bad. Is it effective? Is it producing the result in your life that you want? Is this friendship producing, so it's either effective or not effective? Like you, you made this and it's like, oh, this is bad. This cake, it, it, it just tastes bad. No, it doesn't taste bad. It doesn't resonate with whatever you were expecting, whether that's it's burnt. It, it didn't work. It's not effective as a cake because cake is supposed to be moist. I shouldn't take the cake and go, <laughs> I'm not eating that. <laughs> right? It didn't, it didn't show up in its highest and best. Right? So this idea of how do we, like how do I always remember where I'm coming from? Because it's not about, remember, uh, was, I don't remember if it was song or story or I don't remember where. It was, there was so much goodness. But, but somewhere this idea of where am, I, where am I extending from? What in me is reaching out to life? Because if, there, if we believe in any way, shape, or form this thing called karma, not karma as you did bad in a, bad in a former life, now you're getting punished. No, not no. Karma being cause and effect. Karma being if I go outside and there's ice, and I wear my slippery shoes, and I slip and fall, when you knew that cause and effect, right? So what am I extending out into life for life to boomerang back to me? What am I walking in through and as? How do I choose to show up in everything? So ordinary spirituality is, how do I show up when I'm in the grocery store and someone in front of me, three people in front of me, it's the six items or less line, six items or less. <laughs> okay, I count 24. I can't see what's under there. There's more than 24 things in there. Should I, should I tell him? I feel like I should tell him. I feel like I should set him right. I feel like I should I should be the law. Yes. I'm shoppers. Guardian of aisles and lines. Six items or less, sir. You have six times four items in this cart. You need to get it in one of those lines. Do it now. <laughs> like, we feel like we have to, we get this thing of righteous indignation welling up in us. Like, it's, it's, wait a minute, wait a minute. Look, 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 look at the number on the register. She bought all this stuff, and it's, it's $59.17, and she's paying in nickels. <laughs> and coupons! 
I've got an appointment. I've got to be somewhere in 30 minutes. And we sit and we stew. She's not making us angry. We're making us angry because of how we are judging and perceiving this thing. They're simply doing what they're doing. How many times have we done something and weren't aware of it and somebody behind us is like, <laughs> like they're turning our milk sour behind some of this one I'm Right, right. It's like how, because we don't know sometimes. So the idea is how do we always say in this moment, right here, right now, as the song said, not in the past, not in the future, this moment, right here, what am I doing to be my best? Because if I'm my best, then any interaction I have with any person, I'm always presenting myself as my best. And if I'm always presenting myself as my best, then part of that means namaste. There is this part of me that is the truest part of me, that is the part of me that was never born, that can never die that is beyond all shape and forms. It is the named and the nameless and the yet to be named. It is everything. And when it, when I'm at my best, when I am at my best and I can see that in another, then it's like what Miriam Williamson said, when we shine our light so brightly and so freely, we give other people permission to do the same. We give other people permission to be their best selves even when they don't know it, even when they can't acknowledge it. Last two things, and then I'm done. One, my brother Leslie transitioned three or so years ago. Now, in my 53 years, I have been to well over 2,000 funerals, wakes, funerals, viewings, whatever. I've had a very, very over, over saturation of and death has always been this, I don't want, I don't like, I don't, don't, don't. But I'm at my brother's viewing, and I'm happy. And at first I'm thinking, well, I'm happy, and it's a bad thing, because like I'm, then I realize I'm happy because I now realize that that's not him. I realize that the part of him that is the truest part is not there. And so I was able to find this place of joy in order to then serve the other members of the family and friends. I was now, rather than being all about him and box and death, it was about life and being life-affirming. A couple of years ago, I'm walking down uh, Constitution Avenue or Independence, or one of them, in D.C. And as I'm walking... You know, just had uh, Starbucks with a friend, and we we're talking metaphysical stuff, deep stuff. Do you think Oscar the Grouch has legs? Like, it was deep, <laughs> deep, <laughs> deep, profound. And in the background, I hear someone scream out the N-word. <laughs> Loud. And I just kept on walking, like it didn't even register. And then I start to see the reaction of people over here, because they're seeing me, and they're seeing what's behind me, where it's coming from. And I see their reaction, and they're like, oh. <laughs> and I'm like, and everything slows, and I'm like, what's going on? <laughs> and at this point, the car, the truck, is now closer beside me, and I hear it again. And then, it re then I realize, they're talking to me. <laughs> <laughs> they're screaming, they're calling me the N-word. Anybody in here Marvel Comics fans, other than... Okay, so you're familiar with the X-Men? Yeah. So you're familiar with Jean Grey and the ability to telekinetically... So, thankfully, I'm not telekinetic because I wanted to lift the truck, turn it, and shake them out. <laughs> but I couldn't do it, fortunately. So the next best thing was pray. Because no one wants to hurt people. No one intentionally wants to hurt people. But people hurt people because they themselves on some level must be hurting. So for me, it was a matter of they don't know what they are. So in this moment, I'm going to know it for them. 
And I anchored myself and I prayed and enveloped them in, and I don't know what happened, where they went, but I enveloped them in so much love that I wanted the smell of the love that I gave them to be what resonated off of them wherever they were going. And after they left, people came up and they're like, are you okay? And I said, I'm fine. They're like, how can you be fine? They just called you this and that because they called me a bunch of other things. They're like, well, how could you be fine? And I said, because I know that none of it's true. That if they were to scream out and say, you're the tallest pink flamingo I've ever seen. <laughs> like, what? Like, we would dismiss it because we know it's not true. So none of that was true either. So what was true? They're divine. I'm divine. We all are divine. So how do we bring that into our regular, everyday lives? Because that's when we become contagious. That's when every word we think, every, everything we touch becomes vibratory with love and joy and peace. Thank you for your time.